Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for this webinar on helping students get a better grade in IGCSE English. I hope everybody is well and unaffected by the COVID crisis at the moment. I know things are bad in India and I'm thinking of you. So as Sumit said, this is part two today. Uh, and I'd like to start with some warm ups. So if you would like to use your chat box, please tell me what the mistake is in that sentence. That's an example sentence from the examiner's report in 2018 that was written in an exam. What's the mistake there? Use your chat box to tell us. Looking for answers, Elaine, as usual. Uh, error in the spelling, there is an error with the spelling noise. Yes, absolutely. A student has got the letters in the wrong order and has spelled nosy rather than noise. Great. Um, let's move on to the next one. I don't know why this is not moving on now. There we go. What's wrong here? What's wrong in this one? Uh. It's hard to see what this sentence means. Again, it's from the exam, from the IGCXC exam, 2018. What do we think might be wrong here? Waiting for answers again. Uh, both on Facebook as well as uh, yeah. Zoom. So, I think the problem here is that it's very hard to know what it means and obviously fragment. Builders... Ms. Nagma Sheikh says fragment. Ms. Nagma Sheikh says fragment. Uh, she's mentioned the word fragment here, but I don't understand. Ma'am, if you could uh, explain. OK, it, it, it's fine. I think the problem is that the word builders should really be buildings. The student is trying to say that it looks as if these huge buildings were held aloft and with nothing to support them. And I think they haven't expressed themselves clearly, but I think builders is supposed to be buildings. What about the next one? What's wrong with this? Again, this is from the exam, from the 2018 exam. These are all mistakes that stu students have How made. How bizarre is that? How bizarre is that? I think it should be. Yeah, so it should be spelled B-I-Z-A-R-R-E. Obviously, the student has confused bizarre, meaning a marketplace, with bizarre, meaning strange. So two homophones have been confused here. What about this one? What's wrong here? Emphasize with each other or sympathize? Empathize. Empathize. It be empathize. Empathize. Yeah, children will need to empathize with each other. Again, that's another mistake directly lifted from the 2018 IGCSE exam. So what we've been thinking about in the part one on the 18th of June and what we're going to be thinking about today is how can we help our students get better marks in their Cambridge exams? This involves helping them become more independent learners. And we need to be developing these skills from primary school. It's no good leaving it until the student is 14 or 15 and they've embarked on the IGCSE syllabus. They've got to be developing these skills from very early age. And it's important because some of the mistakes we're going to be looking at today prevent students from scoring top marks in the exam and from getting a really good grade. So, some of these are skills that will help students get that A star or an A or a B. So these are really valuable skills that are gonna get students stronger grades. In the first part on the 18th of June, we looked at teaching, looked at the examiner's reports on the importance of reading to infer and vocabulary skills. Now they're linked because one of the, one of the ways we can teach children to read to infer is to really help them understand connotation and understand the connotations of different words and what words are implying. So they are linked. So this is what we looked at in the first webinar on the 18th of June. And we talked about these comments from the examiners, how candidates must remember to develop ideas that are inferential. 
they have to look for implicit ideas in the passage and they have to pick up on the clues that the author, the writer is giving them in their choice of words. Uh, and we also looked at the importance of vocabulary, building up a good vocabulary, both for inferential reading, passively, but also we talked about how the examiners are looking for a wide range of vocabulary to be used in the in answers. If you lift from the exam, from the tech, from the text in the exam, you're not going to score very highly. And today we're going to be looking at these two things, how the examiners comment on structure in students independent writing in the exams and all of the avoidable errors that are losing students' mistakes, that are losing students' marks. So when we think about structure, the examiners have made these points that the better candidates structure their responses independently, selecting and commenting on the details in the passage to support a cohesive argument of their own. Weaker candidates, candidates scoring lower marks reiterate the ideas in the passage, lift and copy from the text in the reading passage, use a limited structure and rely on the wording and structure of the passage in the exam. So the examiners very clearly are looking for students to be able to structure their answers independently and not to rely on the structure of the passage in the exam. So we're going to be looking at how we can help students develop these skills. And we're also going to be looking at this. Marks were lost through avoidable mistakes. The student who wrote, isn't that bizarre, would have lost a mark because the, they used the wrong word and they were not clear. Um, the student who wrote, great builders held aloft by nothing will also have lost, lost marks because the examiner hasn't understood what they've meant because they've made an avoidable mistake. Candidates need to ensure they pay attention to spelling, punctuation and grammar to assist clarity. And careless errors with spelling that affect, me that affect meaning are going to be marked down. Band eight, to get a band eight and get an A or an A star, you've got to be virtually error free. And you're going to start to lose marks once you make mistakes with homophones, once you don't use adverbs correctly, once key words such as opinions and appreciate are used incorrectly. These types of errors also lost marks, basic punctuation and grammar errors, lack of paragraphing, errors in agreement and tense, sentences without a main or a finite verb, incorrect use of participles, omission of the definite and indefinite article or mixing up of the two. Fairly common problem in India, I have to say, it's going to lose students marks. Persistent use of commas where you need a full stop. These are some of the mistakes, the careless mistakes that students are making in their exam and that are causing them to lose marks and not get those top grades. Misspelling of simple words, wrongly selected homophones, prepositions can go on. Sometimes only a mark in band five could be awarded because serious errors impacted and have a negative effect on communication. So it's a serious point. So to summarize, examiners are looking for independently structured writing and they're looking for accurately written prose. No, no careless mistakes with spelling, grammar, punctuation, care taken with words that are homophones, particularly those that affect meaning. Now, the way that we're going to come at this is through metacognitive skills. What the research says is that too often we teach students what to think, but we don't teach them how to think or how to learn. And the how to think, how to learn is where metacognition, metacognitive skills come in. It's about the processes involved when students can plan their own work, monitor how they're going about that work and evaluate 
how effectively they have learned something to make practical changes in their own learning style. So here's an example that I've been using for the last year, 18 months. In uh, September 2019, I went to Indonesia and I was doing workshops on metacognitive skills and the teachers challenged me to learn something. So I could demonstrate how I learn as an individual by harnessing my metacognition. I know how I learn. I learn through making associations. So they taught me the first five numbers of the Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesian counting system. And the first five numbers are Satu, Dua, Tiga, Empat, Lima. And I learned these using a mnemonic. Saturday, dual teachers emphasized learning in magical action. And that's my mnemonic to remember Satu, Saturday, first three letters, dual, dua, first three letters, Tiga, teacher, reminds me that it's Tiga. Emphasized, empat, first four letters. Lima, learning in magical action. So I will never forget the first five numbers of Bahasa Indonesia because I learned them in a way that I, that, that allows me to harness how I learn to learn something. So this is what we're talking about here, helping students understand how they learn so that they can improve their own learning performance and develop the skills that they need for structuring writing and for being able to check their own work and identify and correct error. Right, so talking about structuring writing first, you would often see an instruction like this in some of the Cambridge assessment materials or in a textbook that you might be using. Students have directed writing tasks to do. And you can see that we say students score in higher bands if they use their own structure and vocabulary. And when we're starting to talk to students about how to structure writing, we often talk to them about every piece of writing having a beginning, a middle and an end. But we actually need to, to dig in a lot more deeply than simply saying a beginning, a middle and an end. And the strategies we're going to look at now work for creative writing and also for the directed writing task, for essay writing and for writing longer structured pieces of prose. So the first strategy that might work for some students is to do a planning flowchart. This kind of strategy would work very well if you have students who think quite logically or who think in a line, who think in a very linear way. So the first step in the planning might be to do a planning flowchart where students say, this is my title, this is paragraph one, this is paragraph two, then paragraph three, then paragraph four, then paragraph five. If they think in a very logical, linear way, this is a helpful way to help them structure their overall writing. And they need to do this as soon as they see their title, they need to spend some time planning because it saves a lot of time when we're writing. So this is one way that we can say to students, this is how you can give an overall structure to your piece of writing, to your directed writing task. Or we can say you can use spider diagrams. Spider diagrams are my, probably my preferred option. And let me grab a bit of paper at random. Um, you probably can't see this very clearly, but this is my working at home chart and this has got spider diagrams on. So spider diagrams work for me. Um, flow charts don't. It's a personal thing. So you need to encourage students to experiment. They can take five minutes to try out different options and see what works for them. I tend not to number my spider diagrams, but you can see here that the paragraphs are numbered. So the title sits in the middle, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, paragraph four. 
We can do more complex spider diagrams. The one on the right, you can see we've got the title sitting in the middle, and then we've got lines leading out to a first level of uh, a first level of structure, and then we can go beyond to a second level of structure. And if you look at these spider diagrams, you can see that these spider diagrams actually are digging further in, are delving further in, are being used to define more clearly elements of what we're writing about. So if we have a descriptive writing task and we say we are describing a scene in which a shop manager complain, a customer complains to a shop manager about an item that he, she or he has bought, we'll have an overarching structure. So we'll say, right, paragraph one, customer comes into the shop, uh, next step, paragraph two, customer asks to speak to the shop manager. Shop manager comes along. Customer says, manager replies, customer is happy or is unhappy, customer leaves the shop. That gives us our overall structure. But we can also dig in more deeply and use planning for individual elements. What does the shop manager look like? What does the customer look like? What's going on in the shop at the time? So if we were doing this in a workshop, I would say take a few minutes to jot down a spider diagram for the shop manager. What elements might we include? We can't do a spider diagram today very easily, but tell me using the chat box what you might put into your chart? What might you put in your plan for the shop manager if you had to define a plan for the shop manager? Imagine that you're doing a spider chart. You've got the shop manager in the middle. What are the elements you might put around it? Use the chat box to give me some ideas of those elements. You can use that one of the unhappy customer as a model. So, uh, give you a couple of minutes to do that. Yes. So on Facebook, uh, people believe that the spider diagram is a wonderful idea. Right. So let's have a go at giving me the elements of what might go in a spider diagram to, if we wanted to describe the shop manager. Attire, attire. Overarching. So we might, have a, we might have a blob or a circle with what he's wearing. Yes, his yes. attire. Then uh, the emotions and the appearance. Yes, absolutely. What he looks like. What does his face look like? The facial expressions, the yes. imagery, the uh, gestures. Yes, uh, gesture, that's a good one. Uh, then the experiences, the tone uh, is showing the anger of the person. Okay. Uh, it reflects the anger. Then the actions, the body language. These are all answers from uh, Facebook. Yeah. Miss right. Nagma Sheikh says personality could also be. You could if you wanted to go into that level of detail, yes. Here's a quick one that I did. Shop manager in the middle. He looks concerned. On his face, his concern is showing. He's talking politely. He wants to help. He's smartly dressed. He's wearing a shirt, a tie, a jacket. And I've described his appearance. He's got dark hair, blue eyes, and he's tall and lanky. So this is how we might use a spider diagram to dig into elements. So we can use a spider diagram or a flow chart to, to plot out the overarching structure. And then we can use a spider diagram in particular to, de to delve in and give structure to inde independent elements within the, the directed writing piece that we're working on. Here's another example. We can also use a table or a grid or a chart like this to help structure our paragraph. So we might say paragraph one, the customer enters the shop. So we've got the number of the paragraph on the left, the overall focus, what's, what's gonna happen in this paragraph. 
then we've got the descriptive elements, and then we've dug in even further and we've said up close, what might the customer see going into the shop? So this is a way of bringing in yet more structure to our writing before we actually start to write. Paragraph two, customer enters the shop. The descriptive elements might be the speed the customer's walking at. What are they carrying? Are they carrying a bag or maybe a stick? Have they got a child with them? Uh, what are they wearing? Are they wearing a coat? Are they carrying an umbrella because it's been raining or it's very sunny outside? What might be in the customer's eye line? And then what happens in the next paragraph? The customer goes up to ask to speak to the manager. What descriptive elements might want might we want? Who does the customer who does the customer speak to? What is that person wearing? And up close. So we can use a chart like this, a table or a grid, to dig in even further and give even more structure. Okay. So we can have a very simple flow chart. We can have a simple spider diagram. We can have a spider diagram for the overall structure and for the individual elements. We can have a, an even more detailed chart that gives us yet more detail to, to allow us to write towards. This is an ad for a school um, where the school is saying, these are the key points for us that we talk about group work as being an essential part of child development. Each child is nurtured and is encouraged to develop at their own pace. Um, exercise and team sports is very important and to build a healthy spirit of community among the classes and healthy bodies, child-centered, successful citizens, um, classes are small, individual tuition, parents' involvement, scholarships are available, please contact. Again, if we were doing this in a workshop, we would do this and I would say, can you give me the elements that you might include in your own uh, plan for um, an ad for your school, but we, we won't do this one here. It's a bit complicated over Zoom. So what I'm gonna show you is one I did earlier. This is one that I got from a workshop when I did this with teachers in November. And you can see that the teachers have been very creative and that they have said the, the each of the post-its around the outside gives something that they would want to mention in their ad. So they would want to mention the Olympiads, the child-friendly atmosphere, the modern technology, the, the curriculum. They would want to talk about the digital classrooms, activities, Islamic education, which, which for the school in Hyderabad was very important. So they, they used post-its to plan out their structure rather than actually drawing something. So we can also use things like post-its and colour. Um, the next task that we often, so, so planning is very important. This is the instruction, so directed writing task. Students score higher for using their own structure. This is what we suggest they do. They read the passage and then they identify the key points, plotting them possibly in a chart or a table or a spider diagram. Probably not a flow chart because they don't want to copy the structure of the original passage. And that starts to give them a way in to how they can structure their own piece of writing. So let's have a think about this one. You've been given an article to write about whaling for a magazine. Here is the information, three columns of information on the subject, the past and the history, the process and the situation today. How would you order your information? Create a paragraph plan. We can't do that today, but use the chat box to send me in topics that you think should be in the paragraphs that might form your plan. What would you put into your, into your paragraphs? What do you think the key points are that you would want to bring out of this that need to be in a plan? 
Again, use the chat box to give me ideas. So imagine that you're doing a spider diagram. Have you got a blob that says the history? Do you think the history is important? And which bits of the history might you want to bring out in that paragraph? Then what's in your next paragraph? Do you go on to the situation today or do you go on to the process next? And what, which bits go in your paragraph? And whaling is a very emotive issue. So it's a great topic for IGCSE because it allows students to have an opportunity to talk about their own beliefs. So uh, we're getting answers from Facebook. Right. The first is uh, features of whaling. Yes, that's good. Features of whaling, that's great. So uh, I'm just waiting. For, uh, then uh, rules about whaling, environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. So uh, then the next one is mention the safety uh, clauses. Yeah. Then uh, looking for more answers. Conservation of whales. Yeah. So we are in the conservation one. So uh, then the right. pros and cons, pros and cons of whaling, I think more or less cons. Then history of whaling, present situation, its impact, what can be done to stop it? Uh, we have Ms. Nirmala Narayan suggesting past history, first paragraph must include the past history of whaling. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, someone is talking about debate. So we could also debate about animal culling is uh, what Ms. Kaur suggests. And uh, plot of the whaling, where do they whale, uh, which is very important, which countries mm -hmm. and where exactly does whale, whaling happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. These are some examples of how teachers planned out this activity. So you can see that um, this first example was developed by some teachers who teach at primary level. So we can be developing these skills in quite creative ways with young children. And this, this group of teachers who were all at primary school actually did something very visual. You can see they drew the whale and then used the post-its to structure what would go into their paragraphs, which I think is a really nice way of developing structural planning skills with, with young children. Let's make it visual, it doesn't have to be boring. This is a, a chart that I got from some teachers who work at secondary level, I think these were grade eight teachers who felt that something much more rigid and linear, uh, almost chart-like, was what would be helpful for them. There's no right or wrong answer. It's whatever works for the individual. And this is really important. This is the metacognitive skills coming out. These teachers said, this works for us. These teachers says, this works for us very different approaches, but they work for different people. This is why I'm saying students need to practice and experiment and get them doing it from an early age. Look at this one, different again, a very scientific looking flowchart with diamonds and rectangles and circles. I mean, really scientific looking. This doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it's a very personal thing. We need students practicing with all of these different things to work out what works for them. So when they're in an exam, they have a strategy that they know that works and that they're very comfortable with and that they've been practicing for years and they can then do a quick structural plan and they write a really good, really well, independently structured piece of writing that will score them an A star. That's what we're aiming for. But they've got to be practicing from, from fairly young. Look at this one. This is quite different. Again, um, the, the paragraphs are ordered, but not numbered. So this kind of structure, you're jotting down what you want and you've got a structure in your mind, but it's not hard and fast. So if you wanted to change the structure and maybe bring um, the dates back, you can see is towards the end, you might then with another color circle that and stick that up to past history because that probably lives up with the past history section. But doing it like this, then allows you to draw around and see how you want to move things around. So it was a very, it's very interesting. We need to get students practicing and experimenting from a young age. 
And I'm going to show you one more chart that, again, is a closed book to me, this one. I, I don't know how this one would work. This doesn't mean anything to me. I get that one. This one, I, I personally get that. I plan a lot like that, too. This one doesn't mean anything to me, but we can, we can get children practicing and experimenting. So we need to be doing it from very early age. And as I say, we can be getting children to do, to do it very visually, bringing in color, bringing in post-its, bringing in pictures and drawings. There's nothing wrong with that at all. The key thing is to help students develop their own individual strategy for planning and structuring their writing. And when we're doing these exercises and activities in the classroom, start with the simple things to give the overall structure and then start to, to tease out. Right. So we've got our overall structure going back to the angry customer in the shop. Let's now do a plan for what the customer looks like. Let's now do a plan for what the shop manager looks like. Let's do a plan for what's going on in the shop that is happening outside of the two shop managers. Let's look at the chart. Paragraph one. This is what we're doing. This is our focus. And this let's really tease it out so we can we can help students by getting them to practice overall structure and then starting to dig in a little bit more deeply, then a bit more deeply, then a bit more deeply. Great. We're now going to go on to this. The absolute importance of checking over in an exam situation for silly mistakes that are going to lose marks. I can't emphasize this enough. Students lose marks when they make silly mistakes. And those four mistakes, those four warm ups at the beginning were all from an exam, the 2018 IGCSE English exam. And they would all have lost their student, their, their, the, the students who wrote those would all have lost marks because of those exams, those mistakes. And you can see some of them are very silly. That nosy instead of noise, really silly mistake. So we've got to help students become independent checkers of their own work. You're not going to be there in the exam. These are all the mistakes that the examiners have talked about. I've looked back over two years worth of examiners reports and the same points are made every year. Right. These are some of the mistakes from 2017. What's the mistake in that, that sentence or that phrase? Use the chat box. Any answers? So, uh, vocabulary. What, ex what is wrong? What is wrong with the vocabulary? What's wrong? Uh, What's wrong flawed. with that? Flawed. What should it be? What should it be? Somebody it type should be in flawed. The word. It should be flawed. So, spell it for me. F L A W E D. Brilliant. Yes. What are flawed and flawed? What do we call words like that? Anybody got the answer? I'm looking for the answer. They're called homophones. Homophones, absolutely. The student has made a silly mistake with homophones. Right, what about this one? What's wrong with this? Answers to the second one is uh, the spelling. It should be condensation. It's more than the spelling. It's a completely different word. It's yes. a completely different word. It should be condensation, not condescension. They're different words. Very close, obviously confused. What about this last one? What's wrong with this? You must not get confidence. Uh, you must not let confidence in the way. You must not let self-confidence self -confidence, not get coincidence. in the way. Not coincidence, it's confidence, not coincidence. Okay, 
how do we help students learn to correct these mistakes? I know it's very tempting. You will go through the piece of writing that they've given you in, you write it through and you put the correction on the top. I know it's very easy to do that. That's not what we should be doing. What do we want students to use to start to become independent correctors of their own mistakes? What do we use? What do we want students to use? Nobody? Nobody. Nobody? Uh, now I know some of you have been at some of uh, my who, other uh, peer What editing? do I always say? Abhinandan says, Abhinandan says peer editing. So I think Ab they're taking some time. Peer editing. Type. Yeah. Uh, Miss Malini Gopal says do? edit peers work. Yeah, we can do editing of peers work, but you Miss Nagma Sheikh says checklist. Checklist. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. What do we Use want? Dictionaries. <gasps> Thank you. It's, this is a it's Jamaican Abinandan. one. Abinandan. Yes. This is a Jamaican one, but it's the only one I've got handy on my desk. The single most underused resource in the English language classroom anywhere in the world. And this is what we do. So you've had, you've, your student has written your 40 flawed fictitious article using F-L-O-O-R-E-D as a mistake. Underline it, make them then go and look it up for themselves in the dictionary. Which bit of the dictionary entry will tell them that they've got the wrong word? The dictionary doesn't tell them it's a homophone, but the dictionary yes. will say you might have the wrong word here. Which bit do they need to look at to see that they've got the wrong word? You underline floor, you tell them to look it up in the dictionary. What bit of the dictionary do they look at? Word bank. That's what most I've, 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 put, I've put it here on the screen. Which bit of that dictionary entry do we look at? Usage. Miss Soma Sinha says usage. And says meaning. Ms. Meaning, Akka yes. Says meaning. Definition, the definition. Underline the word flawed, get the student to look it up in their dictionary. The student has to read the entry and then think, that isn't the meaning that I mean here. I mean flawed, as in making a mistake, I've got the wrong word. The dictionary won't tell them it's a homophone, but the dictionary will alert them to the fact they've got the wrong word, a word that doesn't have a meaning, that the meaning doesn't make sense in that context. And that should alert them to changing the word to something that would be accurate for meaning in that context. So we need them to be using their dictionaries. Dictionaries are not just for spelling. What about this one? It was rainy day due to the condescension. Again, we get them to look in their dictionary. What do they look at? I've highlighted it here. They look at condescension. They then look at the meaning. If you say that some, someone condescends to do something, you disapprove of them. So disapproving of people, that doesn't really sit with rainy day. And then if you actually look in the dictionary, condensation and condescension are very, very close together. The students clearly confused two words. So they have to look at the meaning and then maybe they need to look at the words that come before and after the word that they've made a mistake for. What about this one? What does the student do? You underline self coincidence and they go and look at the dictionary. How does the dictionary tell them that self coincidence is wrong? And here is the dictionary entry that they're looking at. They've opened it up. They're looking at this list of entries. How do they know by looking at this dictionary page that self-coincidence must be wrong? Uh, they will find out the term self-coincidence. Okay. That's one answer. Uh, 
they will not find the term self coincident absolutely they will not it's not there well done it's not there it doesn't exist now i know this isn't a fully comprehensive dictionary of english with absolutely everything in it but it's not there it doesn't exist and what will they spot if they look at all of these compound words starting with self they they will see that self coincidence isn't there but what will they spot if they look down what do they see they'll see self confidence and that should give them a hint that maybe that's the one they want that perhaps they've got this a bit wrong so what isn't in a dictionary is sometimes as valuable as what is in a dictionary but you have to know how to use your dictionary and you have to use a bit of metacognitive skilling here you look you think it's not there it's not there because it doesn't exist therefore what i've written is wrong cross it out what is there that might be helpful to me self confidence that's the one i want so it's not just having a dictionary and opening it up you've got to look at it and you've got to think and interpret the information the data that's there that's metacognition that's metacognitive skills if you make students do this and start to use their dictionary from age 5 by the time they get to 16 they will be confident independent learners able to read back over their own work critically and able to spot mistakes Okay. Let's take a couple of minutes to identify some of the mistakes in this passage. We probably haven't got time to do all of this. Other use the chat box to type in where you think there might be a mistake. Yes, so, so we've, got? we've got the answer. The first is father. Yeah, that's one. What else? Uh tried. Tried? Yep. Strap. Strap. Yep, what else? It's Mhm. Mm 2 T O O 2. Mhm. Uh then uh, on Facebook we've got an interesting answer apostrophes. Yep, there's some problems with some of the apostrophes. Uh confidence right and right add sons. I think it is right and sons. Forgive me, I can't yes, see this. Yes, it screen. should it should have capital letters. Absolutely. Yes. These are all of the mistakes. So, um some mistakes highlighted in yellow, some mistakes highlighted in red. If a student gave you this piece of work to do, you would need to to circle everything that's in yellow because that is not information they're going to get from their dictionary. So there's an extra comma a comma after strap where we don't need it. um that we don't need the comma after faint it should be a capital letter on the front of right and sun there should be a comma after london we need a comma after the question mark after sunil and that but begins with a capital letter it should be a lower case and it needs opening quotation marks before it but look at all of the red ones all of these red ones are ones that you can underline and make the student go and look in their dictionary and work out how to correct it themselves so let's have a look at this some of these so uh let's do rung first my phone rung it's wrong how does the dictionary entry tell us what we need which bit of the entry do we look at okay uh punctuation errors past tense form you said the past tense is wrong yes so what we've got here rung is the past participle and we it need it should be ring tense it should be ring rang have a look everything else is in the past tense the phone rang my phone rang my phone rang So we need to look at the inflected forms that are given in the dictionary to identify the correct one that we need here. 
Rung is the past participle. Rang is the past tense, which the dictionary gives you. Rings, third person singular, always shown in dictionaries because some students struggle with the S end ending, which can be irregular. Ringing, the ING form, because it's often difficult to spell. Rang, past tense, rung, past participle. Right, let's look at tried. Tell me what's wrong with tried and tell me which bit of the dictionary entry gives us the information we need to correct it. The spelling is wrong. Yes. Which bit of the dictionary entry gives us the information we need to correct it? Uh, past tense form. Uh, the past tense form. It's shown explicitly in the dictionary, the inflected form. Yeah. It should be Past tense form within the brackets. Absolutely. Yes. Well done. Now let's look at two. Oh, no, not two. We'll do two in a minute. Let's look at it. Um, it's. Tried to read its maker's label. So you've underlined that and you've sent them to their dictionary and their dictionary has got two entries. What's wrong with that it's? It means it is. Absolutely. It's with an apostrophe means it, it is. So what should it be? It's belonging. It's belonging with no apostrophe. You, yes, get the the student, you get the student in this case to read those two definitions and to apply the information in the definitions to the piece of writing. And that allows them to identify that they've got an apostrophe in it and they don't need it. So they have to look in the dictionary. They read two entries in this case and they apply what they're learning. They're using metacognitive skills. OK, so we've got two. It was too faint and it should be T-O-O -O here. And again, the student needs to look at three different entries in this case, but they look at these different entries, they read over what they've got, they apply the information that if you mean too, in the sense of too much or also, it's T-O-O, -O, and they then correct their mistake. And the same with heard, they look heard up in the dictionary, H-E-R-D, and they read and they see through the meaning that they've got the wrong word, which should alert them to the fact they need a different word. And hopefully you've been teaching them homophones and they know that heard can also be spelled H-E-A-R-D and it's also the past tense of hear. So we need them to be starting to develop these kinds of dictionary skills. They become independent learners, but they also then learn to interpret information about language and apply it to their own writing. And I know they won't have a dictionary in the exam, but if they start to develop these critical thinking skills, looking at two and thinking, is that right? This all helps them develop those critical thinking skills so they can critique and read back over their own writing. Getting friends to do it is fine, but we need students to do it for themselves in the exam. OK, some of the we're going to have a quick look in the last few minutes, at a couple of common errors in Indian English. One feature that is very, very common in English spoken in India is the tendency to make transitive verbs that have direct objects in, intransitive. And when you're speaking every day in India, this isn't an issue at all, but in some instances, it can affect meaning. And if it affects meaning, and students are unaware of how it affects meaning, and they use verbs intransitively in the exam and the meaning is wrong, it's gonna be, it's gonna, it's gonna be marked, it's going to lose the marks because it will lead, mean the examiner doesn't understand what they're saying. So call me when you have reached. The traffic is so bad I won't reach for another hour. What's, to me, when you're talking to Dr. Elaine, what, what would I say, oh, I'm not sure about those sentences. What's causing me concern with these sentences? I know they're very, very common in India. I completely understand what you mean, but what is it 
an, an examiner who's maybe not familiar with in Indian English, what's the examiner going to think? Oh, I'm not sure about that. Call me when what's you reach the... home. Yeah, absolutely. What do you, what, what's going on here? There should be an object after reach. There should Where be an object we reach? after reach. It's a transitive verb. For the majority of users of English, reach is a transitive verb. You use it very, very commonly in India as an intransitive verb, but it should have a direct object. So we need students to be aware of this and direct objects are shown in the dictionary. So we say VT, transitive verb, and then you can see we've got it in the definition, reach a place, and in the example, reach a door. So in an exam situation, an examiner is looking for a direct object. Now, with this particular verb, it's unlikely to cause a lot of confusion. So it might be okay in the exam. But this is an example where there is a clear misunderstanding because the direct object is missing. What does she grilled on the barbecue mean? So uh, what did she grill on the barbecue? Grill what? There should be a direct object. The student has meant to say she grilled food, she grilled chicken, she grilled fish, she grilled a sandwich, she grilled, grilled vegetables on the barbecue. She hasn't written that. The, exam, the, the student hasn't written that. What does that mean? She grilled on the barbecue. Grilled what? The sentence means she grilled herself. Perhaps. The sentence means she grilled herself. The sentence means she got the barbecue going and she lay down on it and grilled herself. That's completely nonsense, and that's clearly nonsense. But an examiner reading that in an exam is going to think, I don't understand what the student means here. And it's going to contribute to the loss of marks. So it's important that we help students understand some of these things, and that when students are using verbs, that an examiner might expect to see used transitively, that you underline them and get the student looking in their dictionary to see what the error is and to see what it should be. And you can see here again, very clearly, this is from um, a, a much lower level dictionary for students who are in grade three and four and five, that we don't say transitive, we don't expect them to know the word transitive and what it means, but it's shown explicitly in both the definition, grill food and the example sentence, grill chicken. So, um, lots of examples, um, using nouns incorrectly and putting plurals on the end of uncountable nouns is fairly common. Again, we need our students, when they make those mistakes, underline them, make them look in the dictionary, make them use their dictionary information to make them apply what they see in the dictionary, metacognitive skills, helping them become independent learners, helping them understand how they learn. Um, last one, misuse of definite articles, again, happens a lot with students in India. What's wrong with the sentence, moon sets every evening? But more importantly, how do you use your dictionary entry to tell you what's wrong, to allow you to make a correction? So the answer is here, the moon. Yep, we need a definite article before it. Yes. And how do we know that? Because we just have one single moon. Because it's labeled noun singular. And yes. what else? Use mentioned in the dictionary. Yes. And you can see from the definition, the moon is the object in the sky that goes round the earth. So we really need students to be using this information. Okay, last couple of minutes before I hand over to questions. Cambridge Assessment International Education Student Program Profile, reflective and developing their own ability to learn. 
helping students learn what works for them when they're thinking about structuring their writing, helping students develop their ability to learn by reading information in a dictionary, comparing it to what they've written and analyzing the dictionary entry and in applying the information to their own writing to identify and correct their mistakes feeds in directly to the student profile and helps students get better marks. Um, this is a metacognition checklist for the classroom. S encourage students to think, did that task go very well? What went wrong? What mistakes did I make? What might work better for me next time? How do I learn? I know that I learn Satu Dua Tiga Empat Lima because I have worked out how I learn. I've evaluated my learning style. That's what we want students to do. Did that work for me? Might this work better for me? And then reflection. What did I find easy? What did I find difficult? Which strategies work for me? These, this is the aim of why we want students to becoming independent learners and using developing metacognitive skills. They become independent learners. It's effective strategies for all students, no matter what their background, no matter what their abilities. These are skills every student can learn, no matter how clever they are, they can learn to improve their own learning. Hattie has done the most research into this. And he has done this very complicated exercise, which shows that it is, if a student can develop their own metacognitive skills, it can give them a result of about one GCSE grade. So it's the difference between a C and a B grade, or a B and an A grade, or even an A and an A star grade. So it has an impact on all levels of students, no matter where they may be in the class whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they have learning challenges such as dyslexia, um, it can help everybody. It's all about understanding how we learn and harnessing that to learn more effectively. And just some resources, harpercollins.co.uk home learning has worksheet, worksheets to help you start using dictionaries in the classroom and giving, getting children to use dictionaries in their own learning. So there's lots of worksheets there. These are, this is a blog post uh, where you'll find quite a lot of guidance on metacognition and activities and things you can do. Um, and then the John Hattie resources. And of course, part one, where we looked at reading to infer and vocabulary skills is available on Facebook. Any questions? So looking for questions, Elaine. Uh... I see a lot of praises for the session, perhaps. Wow, wonderful session. Thank you so much. But looking for questions. Reflection helps. Thanks for the enlightening session. OK. OK, uh, so we have the first question from uh, Facebook. Uh, the question is from Ms. Anjali. Ma'am, while correcting the books, if the number of errors is highlighted, will the child lose his confidence? This is where you, as the teacher of the individual children you, and students, you need to understand, understand your student's motivation. And if you think a student, there is a danger of a student losing confidence, if you highlight too many, be selective about what you are highlighting for the student to correct using their dictionary themselves. So if they've made errors with punctuation, perhaps you might want to write those on for them because they can't check those easily in a dictionary. I would, I would, if you think your student is going to be upset by seeing lots of errors underlined to correct themselves, only identify a few, be selective. You don't have to do all of them. You want to inculcate dictionary skills. So what you want to try, where you want to be, is you want to be that a student has written something and it's got lots of mistakes in it. And before they give it into you, that they actually look up 
every word themselves in the dictionary and make their own corrections. That's where you want to be. But you might need to go in baby steps to help students get there just by saying, look, let's do these two first, this word and this word, look them up in the dictionary. And you may need to sit with them and help them or get a parent or a grandparent or an older sibling or peer learning, get a colleague, a friend or a, the, who's sitting next to them to say, let's look it up together. There are different things you can do if you feel a student is going to be demotivated. Only give them a few, get them to do it with a friend, sit with them to do the first couple, sit with them and listen while he, the, the student does the next one and the next one and say, yes, you're doing it right. That's what you need to be doing. Good. Continue. This is where you understanding your individual students comes in and is important. You have to tailor it based on what you know about their learning styles and personalities and what motivates them. Yes, and the next question is uh, from Ms. Ashwinder Kaur. Uh, her question is, how to check and give feedback during the online classes? That's really tricky and difficult for me to answer because I don't understand, I don't understand, I, I don't understand enough about how you're seeing your students writing during an online class. Because a lot of this is about their writing. So if they've made mistakes, spelling mistakes in what they're, they're writing, how are you seeing that in an online class? I don't understand how that works. So it's hard for me to give you advice on that. Okay, the sentences she told us were wrong. How to correct them? If a student has told wrong sentences, how to correct the student? So are we talking about the student speaking the wrong sentence rather than writing yes. the wrong sentence? Speaking, speaking, speaking. I think the student has spoken a sentence incorrectly. Again, it depends very much how many students you've got in the classroom, how much time you've got to devote to each individual student. But if they've spoken a sentence incorrectly, I would ask them to write it down. And then it could be incorrect because they've got the tense wrong. Um, you won't know that they've got any spelling wrong because you can't see that in speaking. If they've got the word order wrong, you need to get them to write it down and then to try and analyze it with them. But again, depending on the nature of the mistake, it might be something you can correct with a dictionary or you might need to send them to a grammar book. Okay. Now I'm talking sorry, about it's difficult for me to give advice on that. Understood. Yes. Now uh, talking about dictionaries, this is an interesting question. How about children making their own dictionaries? Yes, children making their own dictionaries is a really good thing to do, particularly when they're quite young, because they can make them very visual and fun and put in pictures, pictures they color or pictures they cut out of magazines or that they download from the internet. I think that's a good idea, but I would also say students need to have a good dictionary that has been written and published for them so that they can also look up words. Making their own dictionary is great because it means the words that they're looking up and the words they're putting in their own dictionary become part of their own active vocabulary. So that's a really good thing to do because it's been estimated that you need to encounter a word seven times for it to become part of your own vocabulary. So if you're teaching students, let's say we've got little children and we're teaching them colors and you've given them red, blue, green and yellow and you've done some exercises with that and they've looked at the words written on the board and they've looked at the colors, they then go and do their own dictionary using those words. That's great because that's them using the words and reinforcing the teaching. But when it comes to you've made a mistake with the spelling of this word, you need to look that up in a dictionary that kind of activity needs to done with, be done with a dictionary that they have, that they already have. Because those words might not be in the dictionary that they've been creating. They're used for slightly different things. Yes. Was that clear, Shrikant? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I think there are quite a few questions floating on WhatsApp, but uh, due to the paucity of time, it might not be possible. Uh, but we shall take one last question. Uh, and then conclude the session. So this question, the question is from Ms. Bavika. Uh, generally, the children face an issue 
with the question, what is the effect created by writer? How to train uh, the students for this one? Okay, I would say go and watch part one on Facebook because that comes down to the writer's choice of vocabulary. So we need to teach students, not only make sure students have a very strong vocabulary and that they know lots of words, but that they understand the connotations and associations of words. So I would strongly suggest that you watch the part one, which has some information on how we can teach vocabulary skills and how we can start to teach students about the connotations of words. And it's understanding connotations and associations that help students understand what the author is intending and the effect the author wants to make, wants to achieve. Thank you so much, Elaine, uh, for that. Now, uh, while we conclude, I request Mr. Abhinandan Bhattacharya, uh, who's been with us for all the sessions, to uh, give uh, perhaps a word of thanks on behalf of the participants. Mr. Abhinandan, over to you, if you may. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, hello, Dr. Elaine. Good evening hi, to you. Hi, hi, Abhinandan. Nice to talk to you again. Yes, absolutely. It's always a pleasure to attend your sessions. And there's so many amazing takeaways, you know, every moment in every session. So, uh, yeah, I know how uh, educators and teachers in India, they eagerly wait to attend your sessions. The moment the word goes about in the social media, that's really uh, interesting. So on behalf of all the educators in India and uh, on behalf of Team Collins, I would like to you know, uh, express my gratitude and thanks uh, for taking time out to empower teachers uh, in every possible manner, Dr. Elaine. So it's really, really uh, enlightening as some of the participants did mention. And yes, looking forward to attending many more sessions and learning uh, from your expertise. And of course, uh, in many ways we could contribute to the process as well. So thank you again, thank you. No, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I've been really pleased to join you all for these sessions in the evenings, and I hope that they've been helpful. Attending Elaine's sessions are always a pleasure. So uh, I thank uh, Abhinandan for this. And uh, thank you so thank much you. to all the participants who are here, all the 250 odd participants. Uh, thank you so much. And wish you all a happy weekend. Thank you. And stay safe. <laughs>